Hello and welcome to the next lecture for U.S. History. Today, we'll explore a defining moment in the nation's past, the Civil War. There are two primary sets of issues to be addressed in this lecture. First, the opposing sides of the North and South will be compared and contrasted. Secondly, the presentation will investigate some of the major battles, as well as life for soldiers fighting in the war. The image here shows Confederate dead following the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest single day of the war. We will begin by addressing the situation faced by Abraham Lincoln as he entered the presidency in March of 1861. Abraham Lincoln inherited the most difficult political situation any American president had ever faced. Before he took the oath of office, seven states had seceded from the Union. His critics were numerous and didn't believe he had the resolve to address the situation. This map identifies the states in the Deep South which had already seceded from the Union. They had rejected the United States Constitution and formed the Confederate States of America. Lincoln was morally opposed to slavery, yet he declared in his inaugural address, as he had many times before, he would not interfere with slavery in states where it was already legal. Instead, he would not allow its expansion into new territories. He also affirmed he would maintain American sovereignty over all U.S. territory in the states which had left the Union. This assertion was bound to lead to conflict. Conflict was indeed seen with the federal fort located in Fort Sumter, South Carolina, which was desperately short of food and supplies. Lincoln wanted to resupply the garrison without provoking war. Demonstrating his political skill, he notified the South Carolina governor he was sending unarmed ships with food and other provisions to the fort. Before the supply ship could reach the fort, Confederate batteries bombed the fort in the early morning of April 12th. The American commander surrendered the next day. No one was killed in this attack, but the fighting in the war had begun. Lincoln requested 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion in the Lower South. In response, four additional states of the Upper South voted in favor of secession. Here we see the map of secession once again. The states identified in yellow show the states of the Upper South, which waited until Lincoln's call for volunteers to secede from the Union. The debate over secession was quite controversial. Many Virginians were opposed. Representatives from western counties in the state held their own convention, elected their own governor, and applied to be admitted into the Union. The image here, showing supporters of the Union in Tennessee, reflects the debate in this state which eventually joined the Confederacy. Once these states left the Union, they formed their own government with their own constitution. The Confederate Constitution emphasized states' rights and the protection of slavery in any new territories acquired. They also elected their own leaders. Jefferson Davis, a former senator and secretary of war, was elected president of the Confederate States of America. Richmond eventually was named the capital of the Confederacy. The Civil War was not simply a war addressing the issue of slavery. This is clearly seen with the actions of the border states. Border states refer to slave states which remained loyal to the Union during the Civil War. Eventually, there were five border states. Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and then West Virginia. The border states are shown in blue here. Maintaining the loyalty of these states was crucial to the war aims of the Union. Maryland was particularly important as it bordered on Washington, D.C. You can also see on this map that West Virginia broke away from Eastern Virginia and was admitted to the Union as its own state in 1863. Lincoln took bold actions to address the situation with the border states. Shortly after a confrontation between northern troops and citizens in Baltimore, Lincoln declared the area should be occupied and he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. This allowed officials to arrest Confederates and Confederate sympathizers and hold them in jail indefinitely without official charges. When exploring the opposing sides on the eve of the war, it was clear that each 
had its own advantages and disadvantages. The northern states had the advantage of size and population. There were 23 states which remained in the Union during the war, with a combined population of about 22 million. The Confederacy included 11 states, with a population of only 9 million. Of those 9 million, about 5.5 million were white, while 3.5 million were enslaved. Not only did the North, as shown in light blue with this chart, have more population, it also had a much larger population of free white males ages 18 to 20 who would be responsible for much of the fighting in the war. Another advantage for the North was seen with its potential for industrial production. The North included about 90% of the nation's industrial capacity and over two-thirds of its railroad mileage, whereas the South had very little industrial capacity and fewer miles of railroads. As we look more closely at this chart, we see some specifics with industrial production. Look at the figures for producing firearms. The North included 97% of the nation's potential capacity for producing firearms at the beginning of the war. Production of both iron and coal would also prove to be important. Finally, most acknowledge that the South's economy was based primarily on agriculture. However, their number one crop was cotton. You couldn't eat cotton. The North had 75% of the nation's farms, including most of the livestock, wheat, and corn production. Here we see the figures for farm production broken down. The only area where you see the South outpacing the North is with the production of cotton. Here they faced a decided advantage. Overall, as shown here, the North produced about 75% of the nation's wealth. One initial Union strategy was developed by General Winfield Scott. Critics labeled this the Anaconda Plan. It called for Union blockades of southern ports and a major attack down the Mississippi River, which could then cut the Confederacy in two. Lincoln did attempt to establish a blockade, but did not have the manpower to seize and control the Mississippi in 1861. While at first glance it was clear the Union had many advantages, the Confederates had their own advantages as well. One major advantage for Southerners was home court advantage. This was not only important because they knew the climate and terrain, but they could also fight a largely defensive war, forcing the North to travel and maintain long lines of supply. A second advantage involved their war aims. They had a concrete goal in this war. They were fighting to maintain their own way of life. If you remember, this slide from Lecture 13, it shows the structure of Southern society. They wanted to maintain the status quo, the life they'd grown up with. As far as whites were concerned, as long as slavery existed, they weren't on the bottom of society. Northern war aims were more abstract. They fought to preserve the Union. It wasn't until the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1862 that the Union war aims became more concrete. Another Southern advantage dealt with their officers. Some of the best officers in the U.S. Army resigned their commissions and enlisted in the Confederacy at the beginning of the war. One final Southern advantage was described as King Cotton. Tremendous amounts of cotton was shipped to European nations in the years before the Civil War. British textile mills received 75% of their raw cotton from the American South. The economic ties between the South and Europe were quite strong. If you remember this slide, also from Lecture 13, it reflects the tremendous levels of cotton exported, primarily to European markets. Southerners relied on European recognition and intervention in the conflict, and many elites in Europe were sympathetic to their cause. However, King Cotton eventually failed. By 1861, British factories had a huge surplus of raw cotton, and during the war, exports from Egypt and India began to replace the need for southern cotton. <laughs>
Following the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation, the war also became a battle to free the slaves, and many in England identified with this war aim. Both Union and Confederate forces believed the war would be short. This idea was shattered following some of the early engagements of the war. The first battle involved Union troops led by General Erwin McDowell against Confederates led by General P.G.T. Beauregard at the First Battle of Bull Run. Crowds of spectators gathered to watch this engagement and initially Union troops gained ground. When Confederate reinforcements arrived under the command of Thomas Stonewall Jackson, it turned into a rout as Union troops retreated in chaos. The First Battle of Bull Run, also known as First Manassas, was important for both sides. Union troops became determined never to allow another humiliating defeat again. For Confederates, it boosted their confidence as they were convinced victory would be theirs in a short period of time. Later in 1861, Lincoln replaced McDowell with George B. McClellan, who was charged with organizing the Army of the Potomac. McClellan was an excellent organizer who transformed the men into a disciplined force. He was loved by the troops, but proved to be extremely cautious as fighting continued in the East. Union forces were more successful in the West. At Shiloh, Union troops were led by General Ulysses S. Grant, who planned an attack on an important railroad junction in Corinth, Mississippi, on the border with Tennessee. In April 1862, Confederate forces staged a surprise attack on Grant's army. Corinth is underlined on the map here, while the arrow points to Shiloh. In the ensuing engagement, the Confederates were successful until Union reinforcements arrived. The fighting was incredibly bloody. Overall, the battle involved over 77,000 soldiers and 23,000 were either killed or wounded. Back in the Eastern Theater, Confederate General Robert E. Lee was on the offensive and by late September his troops had invaded Maryland. Lee hoped to gain much needed supplies as crops were ready for harvest in western Maryland and believed the Confederacy might receive recognition from European nations if they defeated Union troops on northern soil. The ensuing engagement at Antietam was even more deadly than Shiloh. From a tactical perspective, Antietam, also known as Sharpsburg, was a draw, but strategically it was a northern victory. Lee's invasion had been stopped and Europeans would not consider recognition of the Confederacy at that time. Overall, the fighting resulted in about 24,000 American casualties, the bloodiest single day of fighting in the war. Antietam was important for diplomatic reasons as well. For some time, Lincoln had reconsidered his views concerning the war and slavery. Over his entire political career, he had been morally opposed to slavery yet he did not support abolition. He believed the institution of slavery would die on its own if it didn't expand. As the war continued and the death tolls rose, Lincoln drafted a proclamation to free the slaves, but he waited for a Union victory to announce this new policy. Five days after the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. This declared that slaves living in states in rebellion against the Union were free. It did not free slaves in states which remained loyal to the Union. The proclamation would go into effect January 1, 1863. Once again, Lincoln demonstrated his political skill. First, by declaring that only slaves in states rebelling against the Union were freed, he was able to secure the support of the border states while pressuring them toward emancipation. The proclamation itself really had no force of law because Lincoln had no authority in the states of the Confederacy, but it transformed the Union war aims. They were no longer fighting to preserve the Union. Now they were fighting to free slaves. We can now explore life for soldiers fighting in the Civil War. Governments in both Richmond and Washington, D.C. were able to raise armies with volunteers, but they were also forced to implement a draft. The Enrollment Act, implemented in 1863 in the North, 
made all men aged 20 to 45 eligible for the draft. Exemptions were allowed for many, but more controversial were provisions allowing a draftee to hire a substitute to serve in his place. Furthermore, if one could not find a substitute, draftees could pay $300 to avoid service in the army. This prompted cries of, Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight. It also led to draft riots in some areas, the largest of which took place in New York City. In the summer of 1863, many white, working-class men took to the streets. Well-dressed white men, African Americans, and leading supporters of the war were targeted by mobs during three nights of rioting. Several were injured, and at least six African Americans were lynched. Similar riots took place in Detroit, but they weren't as large. The Confederacy also implemented a draft in 1862. It was similar to the Union's, but also included a 20 Negro law provision. This allowed any planter who owned at least 20 slaves to be exempt from the draft. By 1863, those exempted by this provision were required to pay $500, but there was still a great deal of resentment, particularly on the part of poor whites living in the South. As you can see from this chart comparing the armies of both the Union and Confederacy, the Union was able to assemble much larger armies. Also, while each employed a draft and allowed for substitutes of some sort, most soldiers were volunteers on both sides. Although the minimum age for service was 18, thousands of young men who were underage did serve. On the left, we see a photo of Union Private Lyons Wakeman, a member of New York's 153rd Regiment of Volunteers. But the soldier's real name was Sarah Rosetta Wakeman. She was one of possibly 250 women disguised as men who served in the war. Beginning in 1862, African American troops were allowed to enlist in the Union Army. By the end of the war, over 180,000 African Americans had served. Even in the Union Army, they faced discrimination as they fought in segregated units and their pay was lower than that for white soldiers. Camp life was known for its drudgery, but it could also be dangerous. Drinking water could easily be contaminated, and diseases such as dysentery and typhoid fever were common. On the side, we see a camp of Union soldiers. Food for Union troops often consisted of beans, salted pork, pickled beef, and hardtack. Hard biscuits made of water and flour. Here we see some Confederate soldiers. Their diet usually included bacon and cornmeal. Rebel soldiers always seem to be short on supplies, whether they be food, blankets, or shoes. For both sides, the brutality of combat transformed them if they were lucky enough to have survived the fighting. Medical care for soldiers injured in the field of battle often consisted of amputation of limbs. Injured soldiers might, or might not, receive chloroform as an anesthetic. It's estimated about 30% of amputees died following surgery, usually due to infection. The hospital shown here was an improvement over those found near the field of battle. Some of the worst conditions facing soldiers might be found in prisoner of war camps. The most notorious was Andersonville, located in Georgia. The facility was designed to handle 10,000 soldiers, yet by the summer of 1864, over 30,000 were imprisoned at the camp. It's believed 14,000 died at Andersonville alone during the war. I visited Andersonville. It's a powerful facility, which also includes a prisoner of war museum. I highly recommend it if you can make it there. 1863 proved to be a pivotal year in the war as fighting continued in both the East and West. Early in 1863, Union prospects seemed dim. In May of that year, Confederates defeated a much larger contingent of Union forces at Chancellorsville in Virginia. However, Robert E. Lee also lost his right-hand man when Stonewall Jackson was mistakenly shot by his own troops as he returned to camp at night. Out west, 
Union forces were bogged down at Vicksburg, seemingly unable to make any progress. Lee proposed an invasion of the North in the summer of 1863. As they moved into Union territory, they seized much needed food and supplies. However, they became engaged with Union troops led by George Meade at a small town in Pennsylvania named Gettysburg. Fighting at Gettysburg took place over three days. Union troops took up a defensive position along what was called Cemetery Ridge, shown with the blue dotted line and circled on the map. Confederates attacked both flanks of the Union line, but the largest assault came July 3rd. On that afternoon, troops under the command of George Pickett attacked the Union line. Pickett's famous charge proved a tremendous defeat for the Confederates. Lee's invasion of the North was a failure, and the three days at Gettysburg were the bloodiest engagements of the Civil War. Union and Confederate casualties totaled more than 50,000. The South could ill afford to lose more men, yet Lee lost half his army. News of the defeat at Gettysburg was followed by more bad news for the Confederates as Vicksburg fell to Union forces on July 4th. Grant's siege had lasted nearly two months as Confederate soldiers succumbed to starvation and disease. Soon thereafter, the Union controlled the Mississippi River. With the victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, the tide of the war had clearly turned in favor of the Union in 1863. Although the course of the war changed in the summer of 1863, fighting continued for nearly two more years. The last years of the war brought a series of bloody battles, many of which involved Generals Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. Lee was a veteran of the Mexican War who was loved by his troops. As commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, he was noted for his military skill. Lincoln actually offered him command of the Union Army before his home state of Virginia seceded. Grant was also a veteran of the Mexican War, but he retired from the military following the war with Mexico. He was known for his heavy drinking and was regularly seen smoking a cigar. Lincoln initially named him commander of all Union forces in the West, but was then promoted to general-in-chief in March of 1864. In 1864, Grant and Lee fought a series of battles during which the casualties mounted, particularly for Union troops. These were devastating engagements, and while Lee's forces withstood Grant's continued assaults, his own losses grew as well and prevented him from going on the offensive. Despite the heavy casualties, Grant continued to press on. Farther south, in September of 1864, Atlanta fell to Union troops led by William Tecumseh Sherman. This was a major victory for the Union, as it had become an industrial center for the Confederacy during the war. It also came at an opportune time for Lincoln, as 1864 was an election year. Sherman's victory in Atlanta only helped his own re-election bid, as he faced competition from Democratic candidate George McClellan, the former military leader, and radicals within his own party. Following Lincoln's victory, Sherman took the war home to the civilian population of Georgia as he cut a path of destruction 60 miles wide all the way to Savannah at the rate of 10 miles per day. As shown in this image, Sherman undertook his march to the sea to break the South of its will to fight. The battles involving Grant and Lee continued into 1865. As Lee retreated from Petersburg, he had few supplies and only 35,000 men. Grant's troops continued their assaults, and the end finally came for Lee when he was forced to surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865. The two men met at a private residence, and the terms of surrender offered by Grant were generous. The defeated Confederate soldiers were allowed to return home with their horses if they had them. Within weeks, the last Southern troops had surrendered and the war was over. <laughs>
For many supporters of the Union, however, joy turned to sorrow on the evening of April 14th. While attending a play, Abraham Lincoln was shot by the famous theater actor John Wilkes Booth. He died the following day. The Civil War was the most devastating war in American history, yet it ended in 1865. There were several important results of the war for the nation. First, the war ended slavery. Yet it was unsure how the nation would address the status of this group of nearly four million free African Americans. Secondly, more than 600,000 Americans died fighting in the Civil War. As you can see from this visual aid, American deaths in the Civil War far outnumbered deaths in any other war in which the United States has been a participant. Finally, much of the South had been destroyed. How would it be rebuilt? These and other questions faced the nation as the war came to an end. This presentation has attempted to address several important events involving the American Civil War, beginning with some advantages of both the North and South on the eve of the war. It also has highlighted some of the major battles which took place during the war. Well, this ends lecture number 15, The Civil War. The next lecture will address many of the questions facing the nation at the war's end by exploring the era known as Reconstruction. The following slides will offer links to additional websites concerning the Civil War and a list of sources used to create this presentation. Have a great day.